This is the Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014, an interview with Ken Abdo, the vice president of the law firm Loman Abdo. DMT's coverage of South by Southwest is brought to you by Omniphone, the leading B2B cloud music provider powering global music services including Sony Music Unlimited, Guvera, Rara and Sirius XM. Find out more on Omniphone.com and by Music Graph, the world's first knowledge engine for music, available as a consumer app and as a graph API for developers. Check out MusicGraph.com or Developer.MusicGraph.com. Hello everyone and welcome to DMT's coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and it's a real pleasure today to welcome Ken Abdo, the chair of uh, Loman Abdo Law Firm uh, from uh, Minneapolis. So hi Ken and thanks for joining me, how's it going? I'm going very well, thank you. Good to be here in Austin with you. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's great talking to you. Uh, I thought your profile was super interesting from, from the South by schedule so mm. I had to get you, uh, get you here and get an interview. Hope I don't disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I want to start with your background. So you have been a, a music lawyer for over 25 years, and uh, uh, but you didn't start in music law, so how did you make that transition? Well, I'm, I'm actually celebrating my 30th year as a music wow. lawyer, so giving my age away, but I started out, I was a musician, that's what I did for a living, I was a uh, singing drummer, uh, a songwriter, guitar player, piano player, and that's what I thought I was going to do for a living, was to be a performing artist. Um, I was a very good entertainer. I was not really an artist, and I realized that my vocation was probably in counseling artists and not performing as one. Right. Sure. And so, uh, you know, you uh, uh, you are based in Minneapolis, uh, which is a, a great city, but it's also not the usual city. You know, for for a music law firm, you do, you always think of LA and New York. So, how have you found that experience of of building a firm up uh, over there, and uh, and how's the scene down there? It, it's been a, a rare and unique um, accomplishment to create a full-time entertainment law firm in Minneapolis, and we have 11 lawyers that work in the intellectual property and entertainment space, with five of us working full-time in the entertainment space, which makes us one of the largest uh, firms, well, in the Midwest for sure. I think we may be the largest. And um, this was primarily uh, built by myself and uh, by, with the support of my firm and then the colleagues that we hired uh, on uh, as the years went by. But one thing that's nice is when you're an, one of the only firms in the Midwest, then you are also a go-to uh, firm for people in that area. And talent is comes from everywhere. Talent yeah. doesn't come from the coasts exclusively. Yeah. So yeah, sure. there's a lot of opportunity to work with developing talent. And as many of us know in the Midwest, especially during the winters, there's not a lot to do except for play your instruments and to focus on your art. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And so uh, looking at, you know, over the last 30 years, you must have seen a, a complete sea change in the music mm -hmm. industry. So do, do you have uh, specific, uh, you know, lawyers that are specialized in digital right now? Or uh, do, do you all deal with uh, the whole uh, the whole 360 degree of, of what's, what's going on? Well, we started out working, as you know, and still do primarily working with content creators, yeah. writers, authors uh, in, in music. And when we started our practice, we were squarely in the analog era. And we evolved along with the technology that brought us into the digital area and digital products. And now we have to be educated in, in, the, in the world of, of uh, online uh, streaming, online subscriptions. Um, basically, the economy, we have completely are moving now, and I think irrevocably, to an economy of licensing and subscribing to music, not buying it to own it. Sure. So, we we follow we follow the, the technologies as much as law does. You know, law really has always chased technology, yeah. and now we are uh, a part of that learning curve as well. Yeah, sure. And uh, I guess uh, a, a big part of the debate today in streaming services uh, terms is the fact that a lot of the heritage artists that are uh, out there with the uh, sort of antiquated deals uh, are not getting their fair share of, of, of revenues from the labels when it comes to, to, to the repartition of the royalties. Right. So uh, are, you, are you trying to be, uh, you know, are you being quite hardcore when it comes to new artist contracts and streaming rates and how much your artists should be getting from, from back from the labels? Interesting that you would um, identify heritage artists and we represent quite a few. And deceased artists and their estates. The good news is they have such a place in the lexicon of music that they that their music is still desirable. Yeah. It's still on radio. It's it is streamed. It is licensed. Okay, so there's a lot of opportunity for those hits. Yeah. Going forward, the new artists they don't have that economy to rely on. They have to 
they have to launch from a spot of where there is uh, no uh, there is no analog or physical economy so it's a much different trajectory in their career so we yeah. are yes very protective in making sure that our heritage artists get the benefit of the new um, digital stream uh, digital sources of music but even more importantly, making sure that our new artists are not lo losing money or leaving money on by table. not collecting or being you know, proactive about the collection of their works. Yeah, and there's like a, a ton of different uh, uh, you know, income revenues as well that come from all these different services. Right. And when you're looking at YouTube, there's a ton of little pockets of income that uh, should be not left uh, unturned, right? That's exactly what the economy has gone to. There are a number of buckets, digital buckets, a penny here, a fractional penny here, five cents there. You know, They all have to be collected. Otherwise, it doesn't add up to be a career. Yeah, and let's talk about your, your panel here. Uh, you know, it's called the Use and Abuse of Interactive Music Application. So that's a field that interests me a lot mm. because uh, I actually used to work for a, a company that worked in interactive music as well. So, mm. uh, and, and it's, it's kind of a weird field that we've seen a lot of companies come and go. It's been tough for anybody to really create your, you know, remixing applications, for example, that uh, took off or, uh, you know, it's a difficult licensing framework around that. So uh, what do you think is the situation now with interactive uh, uh, music applications? Have you seen any, any interesting or exciting companies or developments lately? Well, I think what I find most interesting is that there is a genuine effort now to license music and be able to access music interactively and non-interactively as well online. So um, the, the bad news is that it's a complicated procedure and it's an expensive procedure and the people who control the content, it's not so much the artists but their representatives, their record companies, their publishing companies um, are working to you know, standardize and come up with an uh, with a economic model that is affordable by the startups and yet delivers um, meaningful money uh, to the content owners. Yeah, yeah sure. And, and looking at that uh, side of things, uh, do you think that there is a space here to create uh, a new set of, of, of licenses which are not uh, purely sync uh, licenses for games, uh, but are also not purely streaming licenses, but uh, you know, encompass a broader range of catalogs so that services that do come in that have, a, that have a, an idea in that, in that sphere can license uh, a broader range of music rather than just doing one, one of deals on single tracks. Absolutely. If you look in the past, there were um, protocols and customs with respect to the licensing of music um, in you know for for broadcast, terrestrial broadcast, right. for for um, uh, you know other applications, mechanical licenses, and so forth. They were long established. They were predictable. Okay, the platforms were fewer, yep. but but they were predictable. Going forward, one of the challenges is that there are so many different platforms where music is used in different ways. Yeah. The parameters of the use, the length of the use, the amount of, uh, of um, uh, you know, the terms of the use are so varied depending on the platform. It needs to be standardized. It needs to be predictable, not only for the businesses so they can count on what they're going to have to pay, but also for the, the rights holders so they can get a sense of what yeah. that's going to pay them. Yeah, sure. Because uh, we've seen a lot of uh, you know ad rev shares, and those are not predictable. You know, you give your music out, and then you don't right. know what you're going to get back. Right. So I would have to say, as an artist advocate, I would be most interested in making sure that as much money as could could be made as possible to get to the artist. Knowing that there are intermediaries, there's record companies in the middle, there are publishing companies in the middle. Yeah. We get our monies often through them, and you know, it, frankly, it'd be great to be as if you could circumnavigate <laughs> that and be get, go directly, it might even be better. But yeah. there just needs to be um, there needs to be, it needs to be predictable. It needs to be clean. It needs to be something that uh, that actually delivers meaningful income to both sides of the transaction. Sure, and we're seeing an increasing number of uh, streaming services actually. Uh, have uh, APIs out there that uh, allow third-party companies to access the music that is, uh, you know, is uh, present on the streaming service uh, in their own applications. So uh, we've seen a lot of playlisting apps, for example, that do that, uh, and there were recommendation services. Uh, Beats is launching their uh, API today. Uh, uh, Spotify is, you know, you know, you have loads of apps now that you can just uh, launch and they let you sign in through your Spotify account so you can listen to music. But we've seen also an increasing use of music in a non strictly just purely streaming way so for example there's there's a, a new app uh, um, that allows you to remix uh, tracks on spotify uh, via spotify account uh, which uh, yeah, arguably is, is a bit more than the pure streaming license so so how do you see those boundaries being pushed and and, and do you think that there might be a pushback from the rights holders on, on that front 
Oh, I think that it's going to the response is going to be, be very uh, diverse. I think there are certain rights rights holders that would be interested in in having their fans remix the music. Right now, if it's for their, but the question becomes, and I should say, there are those that would not want that to happen. It's like you know moral rights, you know, right? And uh, that in Europe, you can't really mess with the integrity of a a piece of art. Yeah, sure. And uh, this would allow that, of course, if the if the rights holder grants it. But if they do grant it, then I think that there's a, a whole different business there. Now, the use yeah. of that. Uh, that use of those remixes or you know recreations probably would be fairly limited. I don't know as a rights holder we would say, oh, you can remix something and then redistribute it. Yeah, you know? yeah sure. Yeah. It might be for you to have fun in a private way to do that and, and use privately, fine. But um, clearly, it can be done. Yeah. I mean, clearly, it's happening already. You yeah, know, yeah, and yeah, so sure. we've learned, for example, in America, you, we've learned that <clears throat> when it came to illegal downloads. The, the 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 recording industry's response was to sue all the end users. Yeah, 50, sure. Fifty thousand lawsuits. Well, that's not a good public relations move, and it really didn't change anything. There still is illegal downloading. Yeah. So when technology allows fans to do different things with the content, I think we should learn from the past and say, let's embrace that. Yeah. Let's embrace that. Let's make it legal. Let's make it interactive. Let's make it a relationship building, and let's make some money in the you know in, in the process. Not a not a, a, a prohibitive amount. Yeah, that, but something that would be fair. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I, I, I should point out actually that none of these applications allow you to record any of these things. It's just a way to mess around essentially with the right. with the tracks. So it's uh, definitely in, in that sense they are definitely staying within the the, the boundaries of the licensing uh, agreements. And uh, looking at uh, uh, you know services that are coming into the fold now, uh, talked about Beats, uh, uh, the first streaming service on a large scale that comes in and says, look, we want to give artists uh, uh, their fair share. I want everybody to have the same uh, rates, uh, uh, which is a quite a unique perspective and mm. surprising that they managed to get those deals done. Although there's a big hand in Universal and that, so uh, you know, what what do you think? Do you think that we're going to see more streaming services adopt this model? Of course, Spotify is a big black box because uh, we all know that uh, different labels have different deals and at different rates. Uh, so, uh, what's your take on that? Well, I think the concept of a compulsory a com compulsory license in America has been established for a long time on the songwriting side, yeah. where you would know. You, you can use the, the composition and you will pay this amount of money. Why not use that as a precedent in thinking through the use of, of licensing across the board? A compulsory rate, you know, that you don't have to get permission per se. You know, you can go ahead and do it subject to these payments and then there's a way to police the use and a, and a way to collect it. You know, I, I think that that precedent would be helpful in, in this new digital economy. And, and talking about rates, uh, uh, you know, one of the subjects that I've been covering on the show uh, is a bit more technical, requires a bit more explanation on that, mm -hmm. on that front, is that of, uh, of uh, the, the, the rate saga between ASCAP, BMI, uh, the, you know, the, the withdrawal of digital rights from, mm -hmm. from those societies, and of course, the Pandora in the background, because that's sort of the, the big bugbear that is causing all this noise, is the fact that people want to get better deals with Pandora than they currently have at the moment. So, uh, what's your take? Uh, you know, my personal take was that you know, I I am kind of skeptical of uh, big publishers withdrawing their catalogs because then the bargaining power of the of the independents and smaller players becomes much less. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's practicality practicalities involved in that. So, what's your take? Well, it's a little bit like union busting, right? Yeah. And uh, and that, as you said, takes away from the negotiating leverage of the organizations that are established. To, to assist the songwriters. I mean, ASCAP, the members own the company. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it takes away from the leverage. And I think that what will happen is that if there is a disintegration of that representation, I don't think it's going to help in the long term. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of incentive for, for additional cooperation, but I don't like the direction it's taking because as an artist representative, you know, it's good to have organizations like ASCAP, you know, in the performing rights organizations, BMI, sure. even CSAC, um, is to, you know, to really create that leverage for a better result. I don't, I don't like to see that go away. And I, I don't know that the publishing company alone making separate deals are going to do much better for the artists. I hope so. But still, I think there's a trade-off.
Yeah, exactly. And so we're going to see those developments coming in in the next uh, few months. It's, yeah. take, it's taking a while to, to take its course, but uh, yeah, mm-hmm. keeping an eye on what's happening in New York uh, right now. And uh, uh, finally, I want to ask you about uh, you know, your own artists. Is there any artists that you'd like uh, our audience to go and check out uh, that, that you're working with and that you're excited about? Well, okay, here we are in Austin. So uh, there are artists that, uh, that uh, I'd like you to know about. One is Ruby Jane Smith. She's an artist from Austin, Texas. Uh, she's a savant fiddle player and singer songwriter um and we just found out that lady gaga who's performing here has asked her to perform with her as as a support musician wow so they were looking for a fiddle player and they identified her so that's a big day for her awesome there's another band from uh, austin called wild child and uh, they are working with ben queller's label he's also an artist from uh from austin wild child they have a new album this uh released and uh, an exciting austin band as well that's fantastic. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time, and uh, uh, I hope the the session goes well as well on interactive music. I'm, I'm sure it thank will. You. And uh, uh, thanks so much for for thank joining you. Me today. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest 2014. You can find everything on digitalmusictrends.com and the playlists on YouTube on youtubecom trends.